Someone, someone's got to come up with a hacker handle for him before the end of the session, so think on that while he talks. All right, thanks. Can you hear me? Cool. All right. I'll have to stop moving. All right, well, welcome. Uh, so this talk describes the vulnerability in Azure B2C, as the title sort of implies. Um, it lets you impersonate basically any user in any tenant um, that uses Azure B2C. Um, it has been fixed in a couple different ways. Um, there's some lingering remediations that I'll get to talk about in a, in a little bit. So uh, my name is John Novak, as he was saying. I'm a technical director at Praetorian. Um, most of the time I do security assessments for IoT, mobile, cloud, um, uh, different uh, product security assessments. Um, I do have a background in math and crypto and I'd say I have a knack for identifying what sort of good crypto looks like in common implementations uh, and this vuln definitely falls in, in that category so. Uh, so uh, to get this out of the way at, at the beginning, um, I, I sort of believe that demonstration of security vulnerabilities is really vital for uh, actually getting somebody to fix something, right? Many, many CVEs are theoretical um, but demonstrating them is, is, you know, key for getting remediation. Um, the neat thing about a crypto vulnerability is that I can prove to you that uh, this is a vulnerability without actually telling you how I did it. Um, in this case, uh, I can provide a token in, which is uh, in this QR code here, um, which is signed by Microsoft uh, with a key that I don't control, um, but the contents are all values that I do control. And in particular, um, like the email address field in the token um, is one that's, that's not owned by me. Um, in this case, uh, a token like this one could be used to enumerate all uh, bug bounty submissions to Microsoft um, through their web portal and only using sort of the, the email address of a victim. All right, so before I get um, into the weeds of this vulnerability, I wanted to uh, quickly dive into some sort of background info on um, crypto, JWTs, and Azure BTC in particular. So when most people think of uh, cryptography and encryption, uh, they think of AES or uh, symmetric encryption. Uh, and basically in this mode you have a secret key um, that is used to encrypt plain text and the same secret key is used to decrypt uh, ciphertext. Um, the, the sort of um, cons of this are that uh, you sort of need to negotiate the secret key in advance. Um, so both parties need to sort of have it. Um, th this does provide confidentiality. Uh, in some cases it provides integrity in the sense that um, some, some uh, block cipher algorithms can be uh, modified in transit so that you might not know exactly that, this, that the cipher has not been sort of modified by someone in transit. Uh, conversely, for this talk, um, asymmetric encryption is done with asymmetric algorithms like RSA or elliptic curves. Um, in, in this setup you encrypt with a public key uh, and then decrypt with a private key. And there's reasons you'd want to do this, right? You say, for example, you have email or GPG or something set up. You want anyone with a public key to send you a message um, that only you with the private key can decrypt. So um, in, this, in this way that because it's sort of constructed in this way, there is essentially no integrity in, in the encryption, right? You don't know who sent you the message unless it's been signed sort of out of band of, of this method. So uh, that, that sort of plays a big piece in this, in this vulnerability. So building on uh, encryption types, uh, when most people think of JWTs or JSON web tokens, they think of this uh, construct, uh, a signed blob. So essentially there's a header, uh, some plain text uh, text in there and then a signature on the end. Um, these definitely have integrity, you can't modify the contents without invalidating the signature um, but there's no sort of confidentiality, right? I can just read the, the contents. Uh, another variant of JWTs are what's called a JSON web encryption or JWE and essentially uh, this is an encrypted version of, of the same token. Um, the first uh, block there is just the sort of header values which tells you which algorithms are used and the rest is all sort of pieces of the, pieces of the encryption. Um, based on which encryption algorithm you use, um, this will or will not have integrity and in particular if you use asymmetric encryption, um, there's essentially no integrity because anyone with the public key could construct an encrypted token um, and use it. All right, so um, Azure B2C um, is sort of the, the basis of this talk. Uh, it, it is a service um, developed by Microsoft. Um, B2C stands for business to consumer and essentially what it does is um, you can offload all of the authentication and session management and everything else from what you're developing onto this Microsoft service. 
Um, you can, can set up uh, login flows uh, to do things like um, you know login, password resets, that sort of thing. You can integrate with you know Twitter, Facebook, Google logins. Um, there's a lot of documentation out there. I'm not going to repeat, um, but if you're interested, go go take a look. So when you're configuring uh, your B2C tenant, um, you set up an application. Uh, an application is really something like a single page app, a native app, uh, like a mobile or desktop app. Um, there are several fields you have to fill in and, and on the right here you can see that uh, this is what it looks like in the Azure portal. Uh, you can see you specify like your, your OAuth flows, your redirect URIs, that, that sort of thing. Um, to set up the user flows that go along with applications, uh, you can use something called the identity experience framework. Um, Microsoft, uh, essentially what, what you do is you provide a, you know, a bunch of XML syntax user flows, upload them to your Azure portal instance, um, and, and they're used to sort of configure how, uh, users log in, right? You enter your email, you enter your password, your MFA, whatever you have. Um, there are various starter packs. Um, and sort of community developed samples that you can go online on GitHub and, and download and install. Um, and in particular, there's a tutorial, which I'm going to get to in a minute, um, which talks about signing and encryption keys um, and how to set up these policies. So, so in the image here, this is uh, just set up using the basic starter pack, which has things like um, profile editing, password resets, sign up, sign in, that sort of thing. All right, so uh, who, who uses B2C, right? Um, if you, once you configure it, you set your sort of tenant name and every B2C tenant is a subdomain off of b2clogin.com. So um, you don't get a unique certificate so you can't look at like certificate transparency logs but you can just, you know, Google online and find um, services which will just enumerate all subdomains of, of this one. Uh, it turns out that Microsoft also has, uh, you know, publicly on their website, they have these customer success stories um, which, they, you know, sort of pronounce which, you know, popular uh, organizations are actually using their service. So, um, just from their website, there is a healthcare provider in the UK, uh, a university in Japan, a manufacturer in the US, a uh, government ID service for a country of uh, 5 million. Uh, and, it, you know, even in my own personal life, I noticed that my own power company actually uses Azure B2C. So, it sort of seems to be all over the place. All right. So, um, part one of this vulnerability um, is going to be in this next section. Um, and it all started basically when I started reading the documentation, right? So as I mentioned, they have this, um, this getting started and, and what you see here on the right is just a screenshot of their documentation and if you see it, it, it says to set up a signing key with type RSA and usage signature and then an encryption key with type RSA and type encryption. And so knowing a bit about um, asymmetric encryption, this sort of struck me as a little strange um, and so I, you know, began to dig deeper. Uh, on the left here is a screenshot of what it looks like in the um, Azure portal when you're setting it up. So it's just like a click box, auto generate your keys sort of thing. So once you set it up, um, you, your, your environment gets sort of configured with this uh, OAuth login flow. Uh, and I'll step through it briefly here, right? So you have, you, you get your login page, um, then you post your, uh, uh, you post your credentials like your email, password, MFA, that sort of thing. Once you've completed your authentication, you get a code, you submit that to the token endpoint there and it will, once it's validated, it'll provide you with an ID token and a refresh token. Uh, and then at some point, you know, later in your session, say when your ID token is expired, you can present your refresh token again and get a new ID token and a new refresh token. Uh, the, the format of the ID token is a JWS signed with that signing key that you, you configured before and the format of the refresh token is a JWE with encrypted with that encryption key you set up before. So um, when you generate keys automatically um, using their uh, getting started documentation, uh, what you find is that it, it looks like this in, in the Azure portal. So if you're the admin for your portal and you log in and sort of look at all the keys, you'll, you, you'll, you'll see the, the two keys on the right here. The, the, token signing key and the token encryption key. Um, you can't actually export these um, and, and what you're actually viewing is just the public contents, right? Not the, not the private key part of it. Um, if you instead try to generate an AES key, which is a symmetric one instead of the asymmetric one, you'd get something that looks like the screenshot on the bottom. 
uh, very similar, but again, the, the actual key portion of that is not listed in the, in the portal and you can't export it. So it turns out that um, running through the sort of default setup, uh, if you chose uh, secret keys instead um, and then once everything was set up, you logged in with a, a new user, you would get to this error page. Uh, and it sort of suggests the error message there says encryption key must be 256 bit key. So it, it seems like what happens is on the back end, uh, the auto generation function is generating a key of say 128 bits or something like that. But then when it's generating your token, it's expecting a key of a different size. So, so basically, if a user on the street wanted to just use this out of the box, they would hit this error message and say, you know, what the heck's happening? So it seems unlikely that anyone actually uses symmetric keys in practice. However, um, instead of the auto generation function, they do have an option for generating a key locally uh, and uploading it to your environment. So in this way you can, um, you can know what your key is for your environment, set it up, and, and this is great for uh, Volume Research in particular because I can, you know, decrypt my own tokens with the keys that I know about. All right, so, um, diving a little bit deeper here. Uh, so when you go through a login flow with this open ID scope, um, you will get an ID token returned to you. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this is um, signed with the signing key you configured. When you go through a login flow with offline access, you will get a refresh token, uh, similarly encrypted with the, uh, the uh, token encryption key that you configured. Um, if you look at the, putting the ID token aside, if you look at the refresh token, you'll notice that um, it has some headers in the first sort of block there, uh, but it doesn't have all of them. It doesn't, in particular, doesn't have the algorithms that are used to encrypt the token, but it does have like the key ID and the um, sort of deflate method in there. So um, in my own, you know, test setup, I can upload my own key, I can go through my login flow, get my tokens, decrypt them with the key that I know about, uh, and sort of do a little trial and error to um, uh, figure out what the algorithms were, right? So it turns out it's, it's what you might expect, RSA, OAEP for um, the outer layer of the JWE encryption, uh, and then AES 256-bit GCM. And then once you've done all that decryption, uh, the actual contents are just uh, compressed with Zlib. Um, one thing you do notice is that um, once it, you've you know, gone through all those layers, you'll notice that it's not actually a um, nested JWT. And this is a concept where essentially you have a signed token and then you encrypt that signed token so that you have a signed blob inside of your encrypted blob. Um, so without being nested, there's essentially no integrity, right? I could, um, I could craft my own token. And so this is roughly speaking what the two tokens look like. So if I go ahead and decrypt my refresh token, uh, it looks something like the field on the left. I've formatted it nicely so you can see it. Uh, but essentially when you have a refresh token of this type and submit it uh, in, in the, in the, to the token endpoint, you'll get an ID token corresponding to the, the values in your refresh token. So in bold here, I have a couple of fields which are modified and essentially it's showing that, you know, if I modify some, some fields in my refresh token, they're actually reflected in my ID token. Um, these don't have, these values don't actually have to match whatever's on my account. It could match anything I wanted. You can see I changed my name there. I added some extra parameters that may or may not mean something to, you know, whatever environment I'm working in. So, uh, as I've said, um, with the known format and a public RSA key, I can essentially uh, encrypt and ge generate and encrypt a refresh token with any contents I want, uh, submit it to the token endpoint and get an ID token. Um, it, it should be noted that this, this public key is actually just exposed in the Azure portal only uh, to these three user roles, the um, fairly, you know, privileged admin roles. Um, and so uh, the, the sort of first step of this uh, attack chain, uh, you essentially lop off the whole authentication flow. Um, if you have, you have some, say, unknown means to recover this public key, um, but then using what I just showed, you can generate your refresh token, uh, submit it, and get a new ID token. So um, I, I went ahead, um, you know, I did a whole bunch of this research about two, two and a half years ago, um, submitted it to the Microsoft Security Response Center, um, and, and my submission at the time mentioned that, you know, you need this public key and there's, 
you know, you can get it with this read-only role, but it's really, it's hard, it's not exposed in any other way, right? It's not on like some secret endpoint I could just query. Um, and so, um, after a little bit of back and forth, they, they closed this issue with, um, essentially no action taken in, in April. Um, uh, personally, I'd sort of argue that if your security depends on hiding a secret key or a public key, uh, then it really isn't secure, right? You're just hiding something that, that should be public. Um, it, and, you know, going a step further, it, in instances, so on security assessments, oftentimes we'll get source code for our, our clients, right? And um, we want to make sure that even with source code access, there shouldn't be anything like hard coded keys or backdoors or whatever, right? Similarly, in cloud environments, I, I'd argue that, um, getting read only access to a cloud environment, you shouldn't be able to do things like read your database or, you know, read keys or elevate privileges or anything else. Um, so, um, that's sort of my, my, my two cents here. So, um, if that was the end of the story, I probably wouldn't be here talking at DEF CON. Um, but there is a part two to this story. Um, and in particular, it's a, it's a side channel attack. So, really what I'm, I'm the objective here is to recover the, the public key, right? We have all the other pieces of this attack chain. All we need is this public key. So for RSA, uh, the public key is, um, the, the public components of RSA are N, a modulus of 2048 bits, and then E, your exponent. Um, so for all intents and purposes, you know, 99% of RSA implementations have a fixed E value, so we'll just say that's known. Um, but the modulus is really what we want to figure out and, and recover. Uh, another thing we, we know is that anytime you encrypt something, um, you get a ciphertext, and that ciphertext is necessarily going to be less than n based on the math that's, that's involved in RSA. Um, so you can get, you know, a rough lower bound for what n is. Um, it's, you know, is not very practical. It would take an enormous amount of samples to actually recover something. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a stepping stone here. So what do I have here? I have, when I have uh, a refresh token and I'm submitting it to this B to C endpoint, Effectively, what's happening at, at some level, right, is it's going to call decrypt RSA with a ciphertext that, that I get to control, uh, and then the, the other components of my RSA key, right, the N and the D exponent. So essentially, I, I can I can feed in whatever ciphertext I want. Um, looking at what decrypt RSA is, at, you know, a ten thousand foot view, it effectively does these sort of math operations. It, it computes your plain text based off your ciphertext raised to the power D. Uh, it then uh, verifies the OAEP padding, which involves doing a, a SHA hash on your plain text. Um, if that is verified, then um, it'll return your plain text. Otherwise, it's just going to, you know, chuck out an error and say, you know, you, you provided some, some server text that, that didn't match. Uh, it turns out that this is uh, somewhat computationally expensive. The modular exponentiation and the hash both take, you know, non negligible CPU time to, to compute. Um, so, uh, suppose there is a crypto library that, uh, that does this, right? Since we know the ciphertext, um, is going to be less than our value n, um, why not just add an if statement at the top that says, if your ciphertext is too big, just error out, right? Don't, don't, don't do the rest of the decryption, save yourself some time, uh, and, you know, return the error. This, this shouldn't actually expose any sort of information, because, again, n is supposed to be a public value. Uh, and so th there's no sort of crypto bug in any library that, that's out there just based on this. Um, however, what, what you do get is you get a time differential, right? So if I am providing a ciphertext that is um, greater or less than n, this decrypt function is going to return in one of two different times, right? Um, and, and so based on if I can observe the, the timing difference, I could see um, so what, what I, I could clean some information about what, what the, what N actually is. All right, so I did this. Um, I took a, uh, a JWE with a cipher encryption key of two to the 2047 and then one with two to the 2048. I knew these values would be both less than and then greater than N. Um, I submitted both of these tokens to my uh, B2C token endpoint. Uh, and then, you know, observed the, the response time and, and compared. Uh, one thing I will note that, um, that you're trying to observe a, a time that is sort of very small here, right? So doing this over my, you know, my home laptop, over my Wi-Fi network, all the way across the internet to the endpoint, 
is going to introduce a lot of jitter in, in your timing, right? So I try to reduce this as much as possible, doing things like, um, you know, say running on as Azure Cloud infrastructure, right? Um, just uh, shorten the distance between where my code is and where the endpoint is. Um, I also try to avoid some load balancing by, you know, fixing IP addresses so that I wasn't hitting different B2C token endpoints every time I submitted a request. Uh, and then other things like, you know, pipelining your, your TLS session and, and stuff like that. So what, what you find is that with these two values, um, you, I, I submitted 2,000 requests of each type uh, and plotted them. And, and essentially what you see is that um, the ciphertext that is smaller is in blue here and the larger one is in red. And you'll note that the curve for the blue one is just, just ever so slightly to the right of the other one, right? And this really means that there, there is a timing differential uh, and it is observable even across the internet um, to these token endpoints. Um, these, these graphs are very close together, right? They're, they're kind of noisy. Um, but, but it is there and it is uh, within reach for um, a, a sort of timing attack. Uh, in this instance, I recorded the averages at a 28.1 and 26.8 milliseconds. If you ran this at home, it, it might, you know, differ based on where you're, where you're running from. So, um, let's generalize, right? We, we have a timing attack that, that tells you if you're greater or, or less than a, a certain value. Um, as any sort of undergraduate computer science major will tell you, why not use a binary search, right? Um, so, you, you take this, this timing differential, you submit a bunch of samples starting with an upper and lower bound and a midpoint, uh, and then you make some judgment call on if your, uh, if the time of your midpoint closer matches your, your upper or your lower bound, uh, and then you sort of shorten your, your search space by half, right? Uh, and then you repeat. So essentially, uh, this sort of timing attack based on this, this fact lets you recover one bit of your, your public key for each round. So uh, again, I, I did this on a environment that I did not control. Um, because you have it, you're running a timing attack, uh, each of these rounds is not uh, fully reliable, right? Um, there are going to be instances where you, you do your timing attack and uh, you actually guess incorrectly what, where the midpoint was. So I had to build in some logic for uh, backtracking and um, assuming, you know, backing it one step up in my binary search so that I didn't just go down a rabbit hole that was incorrect. Um, additionally, the, the Azure token endpoint has rate limiting, so I couldn't just uh, spam it with requests as fast as I wanted to. Um, but all in all, uh, I, th I implemented this attack and ran it on an environment that I did not um, control, uh, and it recovered about 50, 55 bits an hour. Um, this may seem slow. Uh, however, um, refresh tokens probably are valid for something on the order of 90 days, and so you know, the keys associated with those are likely valid for something like years, right? So, and it, even if your attack takes a day and a half for a key that lasts a year, I think that's, that's perfectly, perfectly reasonable. Um, this graph here is, is the sort of attack in action as I implemented it. Uh, you see in the, the zoomed in part there, the, the jitter is essentially the backtracking, uh, and then the little gaps that are uh, uh, in there are, are the uh, rate limiting that, that I was hitting. So uh, th there we go, the, the attack is sort of complete now. Um, I have this timing attack, but I can recover this public key. Uh, I can generate a refresh, refresh token with any user details, uh, and then I can post this refresh token and uh, get back an ID token with whatever I want, right? So essentially, I can, I can use this to compromise any, any B2C tenant that, that I like. So um, going back to the very beginning here, uh, demonstration, right? Um, when you, if, you know, I'm sure some of you in the audience have submitted vulnerabilities to, me, to Microsoft, uh, when you do that, uh, you likely went through the Microsoft Security Response Center. Um, when you go to the login page, you'll notice that um, it is this msrcweb.b2clogin.com. So essentially, Microsoft is using um, B2C as their authentication service for submitting vulnerabilities to their platform. So it seems like a perfect target. It doesn't, it, it's a Microsoft property, it's not going to violate their sort of terms of service, right, but it's going to demonstrate that I can, that I can do something on, an, on a live environment that, that isn't my own. Um, so, um, oops. 
so as I mentioned, um, it, you just, you know, you go through this login flow. Um, if you, it, it's basically as easy as if you're, you know, if you run your, your session through a proxy like burp or something, uh, and then just observe all the, the uh, back and forth, you'll, you'll see basically all the components of the login flow you need, right? The, um, the, uh, um, all, all of all the artifacts that are, that are part of it, right? And, and how you get the refresh token um, at the end. So there's there really no guesswork in, in how to set up the OAuth login flow in a custom environment. You don't, you don't really need that. You can just sort of replay, replay requests as, as necessary. So, right, I, I ran the stack. Um, I recovered the public key for this MSRC key ID. Um, I used the known format to make a refresh token for a victim that I did not control. Uh, I encrypted the contents, sent it to their token endpoint, uh, and then got back an ID token for that uh, fake victim user. And so we're, here we are back at the beginning again. Um, this is one of a couple ID tokens I was playing around with. If you look at the actual contents in there, um, the email address is um, alice.bob at example.com. I, I don't own that domain, um, don't have access to that account, nor do I actually think it's a bug bounty researcher. Um, and I also, um, for kicks, uh, added an additional parameter, DEFCON 31, in there just to show that you can just inject whatever, whatever sort of claims you would want into your, into your ID token. So um, if you're sitting in the audience and want to verify this, um, I haven't checked today, uh, but the, I believe that the public key associated with these ID tokens uh, is still the same, um, and you can just view it online and decode it and, and validate that this, this is a real, real token. So um, what, what do you do with these tokens, right? Um, well, uh, on this domain, the, probably one of the most interesting things you wanna do is list vulnerability reports, right? Um, so I went through the legwork of constructing a, um, an ID token with the least, the smallest set of claims that I needed um, to list um, vulnerabilities for, for a user. Um, so I can't zoom in here, but if you look at the decoded section, there are actually um, a bunch of the fields are zeroed out, essentially meaning that I can craft the token, just put in dummy values for a couple of them, um, and it'll still validate for, um, it, and you can use it for any account. There are a couple non-random values in there, I'll grant. Uh, however, again, if you just look at your sort of burp history as you're running this attack, you'll see that the audience and tenant ID values are just, they're in public information, right? They're in like client-side JavaScript, um, URL headers or HTTP headers, stuff like that. So they're not hidden values um, to find. They're, they're actually just, just public. So um, I could essentially use this to list any uh, vulnerability submissions to <laughs> knowing only a user's email ac account, right? Um, likely these are things like, you know, Windows, Azure, Exchange, zero days that people have submitted that are not yet patched. Um, I'm sure that, as with any bug bounty program, there's a bunch of junk submissions that are in there uh, that you'd have to wade, <laughs> wade through. But, um, you know, knowing if you wanted to use this and knew a security researcher's email, um, odds are you, you could have used it at the time. Um, for this environment, you could have also done things like, you know, change their payment processor ID, so essentially stolen all the bounties they would have gotten, uh, but I'm sure that would have, you know, been picked up as they wouldn't have gotten paid. <laughs> Okay, uh, so how does this story end, right? So th really the, um, the, the crux of this issue is, is the crypto vulnerability, right? Um, it, it does seem sort of a bit silly to me to, you know, devise a side channel attack to recover a public value that should have been public in the first place. Um, but, it, you know, I think it was, in this case it was very critical to, to do this to get um, the issue uh, understood and taken seriously, right? Um, and in general, I, I sort of believe that, you know, um, crypto vulnerabilities and misuse can often be misunderstood. You know, people will see it and say, oh, that's just some crypto bug that's theoretical and never going to be able to, to do it. Um, I, I wrote a blog post which talks about essentially part one of this talk, uh, not the, not the uh, side channel attack. Uh, it's on our, our company blog. Um, I, I'd say at, at this point, uh, my recommendation to users of Azure B2C would be to, instead of using that RSA uh, asymmetric encryption, switch to the, the secret encryption with AES. Um, I believe Microsoft is still working on it, but I think they're going to put out a, a change that should make it sort of straightforward to, to make that change. 
And, you know, if you do that, essentially that lack of integrity that you get with asymmetric encryption can just be replaced with the, um, the integrity you do get with symmetric encryption so that it would sort of negate this, this altogether. Um, long term, I think my, my, um, suggestion to Microsoft was to use, um, nested JWTs, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this is, uh, you know, I recognize that it's a sort of hard engineering problem, um, and changing the structure of something that, that sort of underpins your whole authentication flow is, is not an easy change, right? Um, so, um, at the very least, you know, if I was remediating this bug myself, like, it would essentially invalidate all, um, uh, all keys for all sessions for all users, right? And so, the usability alone would be sort of, uh, horrendous. But, um, I, I think long term that's, that's what you need to do. And I believe Microsoft is, um, working toward doing something analogous to j nested JWTs for their, for their platform. So, um, uh, disclosure part two, right? So, um, in July 22, 2022, about a year ago, I discovered this sign channel attack, um, and disclosed it to Microsoft. Um, there was a, um, a period of, uh, not, not great responses for, for a little while, um, but I did manage to talk to the team and, you know, get them to validate the issue. And the, the first of, of two fixes was, put in place in December 2022. And essentially what that fix does is that now if you submit a token that is invalid uh, of any format, um, your HTTP request will essentially just get dropped. Um, it will, the, the connection will hang, it won't return. And so essentially what happens is you get no timing information, right? So there's no timing attack to, uh, to recover that key in the first place. Um, it, this is a good sort of stopgap measure because it sort of, um, negates the attack as, as I described it. Um, but, but it doesn't go as far as putting all the nested this stuff in place. Um, that, that second part was, um, planned for February 2023, but there were some, uh, engineering complications as I sort of, as I understand it. I, I really don't know all the details about those, but, um, that fix wasn't quite put into place, uh, in February. Um, this is, a sort of the disclosure timeline from, uh, July to, uh, February when I published that blog post. Um, you can, you can look at the slides in, in your own time on the DEF CON media server, but, uh, it, essentially it shows sort of back and forth and what was happening with different parties at, at Microsoft. Um, the, the risk rating for this vulnerability was, um, assigned important, uh, not critical. Um, I, I personally argue that if all you need is sort of tenant details and an email address and what you get out of it is full compromise of a victim, that's going to be a critical vulnerability, right? <laughs> um, it doesn't seem like just something important. Um, but, but I digress. Um, it was also categorized as, uh, info disclosure, not elevation of privilege. Um, surely yes, a public key was disclosed. So maybe by definition, um, that is the right way to categorize it. Um, but again, I, I sort of argue that you're recovering a key that can, you can use to grant yourself privileges to anything you want. So, um, maybe it falls into the latter category. Um, unfortunately, um, at disclosure time, uh, Microsoft had two bug bounty programs that, that might have applied. Um, there was the Microsoft Azure bounty program and the Microsoft identity bounty program. So, um, it turns out this bug was not eligible for the Azure one because it isn't an identity service. Uh, it also turns out it's not eligible for the identity program because this BDC login.com was not in scope, uh, for that program. So, despite being a somewhat important bug for this service that they're using internally, um, it, it is in ineligible for any bounty program. So, uh, was not rewarded. Um, I, w I will say to Microsoft's credit and some lengthy back and forth I've had with them since they have added Azure B2C to their identity program, uh, in the intervening time in, uh, July or June a couple months ago. Um, but bounties are not sort of retroactive. So, um, it's, it's not going to get paid out. Um, so the, the last slide here on Microsoft, the, um, there are some, uh, lingering remediations I, I mentioned. Um, the, the first fix that I mentioned in December was, was kind of narrow, right? It was, um, cutting off the, the, um, just the timing attack itself. Um, so it, it's unclear if there are other artifacts in that session you could use to still recover a key, right? If they're, uh, terminating the connection or, or whatever, right? Um, and I was sort of inspired by James Kettle's talk this morning, uh, talking about 
um, his, his tools to, to do similar things. So it may be possible to, to get around this mitigation, um, but, but I haven't really found any way. Um, I ha also haven't checked uh, quite yet today, but I think they are actually going to um, encourage users to use the secret key generation instead of the, the uh, public key or the RSA key generation. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, the, the new sign element in the refresh tokens isn't quite implemented yet, but um, I think they're, they're still working toward that. Okay. Um, so just for the, the DEF CON audience here, um, so most of this talk is focused on, um, you know, an identity service for Microsoft, um, but looking at other vendors and, you know, other OAuth implementations, uh, you might find similar things. Um, so uh, AWS has a uh, AWS Cognito is a service very similar to Azure B2C. It, it is an identity service. Uh, it has a similar login flow. Uh, you get a refresh token. And if you decode the headers, you'll actually notice that uh, the encryption algorithm is, again, RSA OAEP. Um, I, I wouldn't put this up here to, to you know, if, if I thought this was really a bug, but, but it, it is interesting that they, um, they use this. Um, I, I don't have the same introspection in AWS that I do in, um, in Azure, particularly I can't, you know, specify my own keys and upload them and use them. So I can't actually see what the contents are, but, you know, external indicators suggest that they're actually using nested JWTs, so they're likely not a, um, uh, it's likely not an issue for AWS. But it is interesting that, that they have designed a very similar flow uh, to, to what you see in, in uh, Azure. That's all I got. Yeah, I'll, I have a little time, so I'll, I'll take some questions, or if you want to find me after, that's, that's fine as well. So we, we have some mics here. If you have questions, please line up at the mics. If you have questions, please line up at the mics. Got Oh, somebody. Oh, hold on. I think they got to heat it. Mm. Give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up. Try it now. Okay. I'm not touching it because here's oh. somebody. Hello? Okay. There you go. Go ahead. Hey, have you tested okay. um, this? We can't hear you. Cut uh. over to that mic. No, go ahead. You. you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Have you tested this functionality against anything else besides the B2C? Um, so, Microsoft for for other things like the MicrosoftOnline.com, they, they have a different uh, a wealth flow that. Uh, it's completely segmented. It looks like a different code base, right, um, from, from B2C. So it, it seems different in that respect. Um, I haven't done a, uh, you know, scoured the internet for every service, but um, I've, I've looked at a couple, yeah. Take a look at the Azure shared tenants. All right. <laughs> Hello. I saw a couple of references to the MSRC kid, and I was wondering if you managed to meet them as a result of the disclosure. If I what? The MSRC kid? Yeah. I wondered if you managed to meet them as a result oh, of your yes. disclosure. Oh, yes. Yeah, he, he had a, a fun and interesting name there. <laughs> I, this is a fantastic vulnerability. I've done a lot of research into OpenID Connect based vulnerabilities, and the cryptography is especially interesting. You know, um, we've moved over the past five years into a world where people are no longer entirely home rolling their crypto, but taking it from off the shelf. JWK configurations yep. and as a result now we uh, have generally applicable crypto vulnerabilities without having to meet an engineer and ask them you know how did you think you put this crypto system together. Yeah I, exactly. I just I thought it was super interesting. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah uh, right going after the uh, one implementation that rules a bunch of different applications is going to get you a beer bang for your buck for sure. I did have one question that wasn't a joke or a compliment <laughs> though. Okay. Um, and you mentioned the so I've done some time at attack based attacks and they seemed very rudimentary by comparison. You mentioned the backtracking. What exactly, could you elaborate on what backtracking means in the context of the attack? Yeah, I, I sort of, um, I, I kind of made it up as I went along, but, but essentially um, if, you know, as I was running the attack and I noticed that there was no actual timing differential in, you know, in this current round that I was on, uh, it seemed likely that, you know, a lack of any timing differential meant that, uh, 
all of my, you know, high, mid, and, and low points were all in this, either all higher than n or less than n. So, I see. Basically, using a, a crude measurement for just detecting that I'm no longer progressing, right? I need to, to go backwards. Yeah, the, the confidence mathematics is very annoying to have to deal with when you're doing a timing attack. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you all.